Here's some data on, well, data. This is research from Forrester. They found that between 60 and 73% of all enterprise data is never analyzed. Data remains a value that's trapped by our own lack of understanding. Yet, countless firms are investing in data, right? From solutions to storage, from software to apps, to new ways of doing just about everything. Data is a frontier, and I think we're just beginning to appreciate its tremendous potential. So we are thrilled to have Jordan Morrow, Global Head of Data Literacy at Click and Chair of the Advisory Board for the Data Literacy Project. He's here to talk about how we can really use this largely untapped resource to make better decisions. He brings some fascinating statistics from a brand new study on data literacy, as well as some proven strategies to learn how to use data for decision making. You may be surprised by some of this. I know I was which shows just how much we all have to learn in terms of becoming data literate. This podcast is sponsored by Click, so shout outs to the team over there. Welcome to the Work Trends podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan M. Biro. Every week, we interview interesting people who are reimagining work. And join us on Twitter every Wednesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, using the hashtag WorkTrends. Recently, an Accenture research report closing the data value gap found a serious glitch in our evolution to a modern workplace. We struggle with how to harness the power of data. And it's not just about not knowing how to use the tech. It's about not trusting in data, not knowing how to include it in our operations, and not being able to open out work cultures to embrace its capabilities or its realities. The survey of 190 executives in the U.S. found that less than a third of companies, 32%, can realize measurable, tangible value from data. Another study released this week by Click and Accenture looked into the human impact of data literacy and the opportunities that organizations all over the world are missing out on by not giving their employees the right training, the right tools, the support to prepare them for the digital era. The research found that just 21% of the global working population are fully confident in their data literacy skills, the ability to read, to understand, to question, and to work with data. And only one quarter, 25% of people felt fully prepared to use data when entering their current role. Our guest today is Jordan Morrow. He's the global head of data literacy at Click and an avid proponent of getting smarter about data and leveraging this incredible resource. Jordan helps individuals and organizations realize their data and analytical potential by bringing to light and enhancing skills in data literacy. How cool is that, by the way? He's also the chair of the advisory board for the Data Literacy Project, which was founded by global firms, including Click, Accenture, Cognizant, Pluralsight, and Experian. And this was in 2018. And they're creating, this is very exciting, they are creating a more data literate society. He's also a trail runner and he and his family live in Utah where there's plenty of space to do that sort of thing. So that's very cool. And I have a feeling that during some of those runs, I bet you he's mulling over how to best help us all achieve data literacy. Just a guess. So welcome to Work Trends, Jordan. Thank you so much for having me. And absolutely on the on the mountainside is where a lot of good thinking happens. I completely agree. I just recently relocated to Portland, Oregon. And um, I'm loving this view that I have once in a while of Mount Hood. So it's awfully, uh, awfully pretty. So tell us more about yourself, Jordan. And are, are you in beautiful Utah today? I am. I'm actually at home. That's about to change with another trip, but I'm at home. I work out of my home, which makes it even better. In fact, I I tell my kids they're spoiled because not every dad gets to to work out of their home. But no, I I live here uh, when I'm not on the world, uh, on the road or in the world, traveling, speaking, working with companies. And uh, my nickname is Chief Nerd Officer. And it's it's a banner that I proudly wear. I am a big nerd, but it's all because I, I love data literacy. I love what's what's happening there, what we've been able to create, and looking forward to watching it grow even more. Well, Jordan, you're in good company because we're a bunch of nerds here too. So welcome. So listen, why is it so hard for us to be data literate? What's going on there? Well, I, I think one of the things that I talk about 
with this complication on this massive skills gap that we've seen. I mean, we, we found that when we did the studies, you know, 80% of organizations or people are not confident in their data literacy skills. So only one out of five people is. And I think part of it is companies for the longest time have been investing in data and analytics, but more specifically in software because they've been told for so long that this software, that software and technology will solve your data and analytical problems only to find out it doesn't truly Really solve all their data and analytical problems. The human element plays a massive piece in there. But then when you go to the outside of that, most people are not going to school. We're starting to see that change with the rise in STEM. And I, I love that it's now getting called STEAM uh, because they're adding arts in there. But most people have not been going to school for backgrounds in those fields. And so when all of a sudden the company says, we've invested in all this for you to be good with data, run with it. They're not comfortable doing that. And so there's this gap that exists. And, and now we're starting to see companies, they figured out they need to do something about it. And that's this world of data literacy. Wow. Can you imagine everybody out there in the work trends community sitting down and hearing from somebody, a colleague, your boss, whoever, hey, hey, here's a, a little bit of data. It's big data. Go run with it. Like that's scary to me. 100%. 100%. And that's that's part of one of the studies that we just finished, this research report on the human impact of it. That's what we're finding is that there's almost this kind of productivity crisis because people are overwhelmed. They feel all of this pressure to use data and technology because that's what the world is. That's what's happening. But uh, they're not comfortable with it. And so this this overwhelming feeling is kind of takes over for them and they might just resort to going back to the old way of doing things instead of embracing the power that this digital world uh, has for us. So what steps should we be taking to better use data? Yeah. So to me, the overarching thing is to realize true potential with data, you need to combine the human element with the data and technology element. There's kind of a spectrum where one side of that spectrum says only use the data and technology, forget the human. And then there are those so afraid or timid that they only want to use the human. They forget the data. We need to combine them. So that's your overarching thing. But in this report that we did on the human impact of data, uh, data literacy, this overwhelming, this productivity crisis, we identified five key steps that organizations really need to consider when they're planning these strategies out. And the first one is setting your data expectations. When you outline clear, identifiable goals, it then becomes an enterprise-wide task to solve those goals versus investing in the technology first and then trying to force fit your goals into it. So by setting your data expectations, clear roles, clear emphasis across the, uh, the organization, you start that process of people understanding how to use data and to achieve things with it, which leads into number two, if you think about it, create a roadmap to achieve data goals. So you have set your data expectations, then creating a roadmap, a true plan, a strategy. Again, don't just buy software and technology thinking that will solve it for you. Create a, a roadmap to achieve your goals. And that needs to include the, the human side of it. Third, arm your employees properly for the data-driven work. And that does include, make sure that once you have this strategy and roadmap, that the tools and software you will be using fit the needs that came about from that outcome-based approach. Because then you can truly empower people. So it, it's technology, it's the processes, the methodologies, bringing that all together. Four, with the human element, you have to close that data literacy skills gap. So that's number four, close that gap. We need to empower everybody with confidence and comfort with data. And what that means is not everyone will learn the same. It's not a one size fits all. Embrace different personas, embrace different skills and then put the data in touch with those people and close that gap by providing learning, by providing those appropriate things to help them uplift their skills. And then finally, create a culture of co-evolution. So companies must understand that as we use data to transform, the abilities of the workforce to deliver on these opportunities must be there. Data tools for the right roles, should be reassessed. It's an iterative process. I never go around and say, we're here to change your culture. We're here to evolve it, but it has to be an iterative process. And when you do that and you look at these five steps, what we should be working towards is overcoming that productivity crisis by showing people, hey, you don't need to be a statistician. You don't have to be a data scientist. Let's get you comfortable with data. And by doing so, you too can succeed in this world that we're working in. Regarding the data literacy skills gap, what's this deal around consumable data? data and how consumable it is. What does that really mean? Can you dissect that a bit? Yeah, kind of, you, you have to look at data in different ways. Okay, so when we look at consumable data, we need 
people who can actually consume it. There's things in this world. I'm going to take it to an example here, kind of maybe a weird example, but hopefully it will make sense. There's a lot of things in this world that would be quote unquote edible. You could eat them. Why whoever <laughs> would want to. And we wait, hold on. And we do. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So it's, it's quote unquote edible, but is it satisfying the goals the ambition, the roadmap, everything like that. We have to have data that is consumable, but in the right manner. So for example, I was with one of the executives and I were in Singapore uh, back in 2019, meeting with a, a bunch of analysts. And he's told this story of how, I believe it was another executive at another company said, we're investing in a lot of data. Basically his response was, I'm not sure why, but someone will use it. And that that is just a very wrong approach. All that data is probably consumable in one way or another, but it should be that roadmap. It should be the outcome-based approach so that when you arm your employees properly with data literacy skills, they know how to ask the right analytical questions that tie back to your business's goals so that when the data is consumed, it's effectively consumed, allowing them to drive answers forward. So it doesn't matter how consumable the data actually is. Employees need to be curious and capable of understanding questioning and then taking the right action based on the insights that they find within that consumable data. Because there's a lot of data and information out there that you could quote unquote consume, but it doesn't mean it's effective or the way I like to say it is it's not necessarily going to move the needle. And by the needle, I mean the organizations or individuals goals that they're trying to accomplish. Let's talk about where people fit into this, right? That's what's really important to to us here in the work trends community, the human experience it seems like a big one. Let's talk about it. Why is that so critical? The human experience to me might be the most critical part of data and analytics today. For far too long, like I was saying earlier, for far too long, become maybe complacent or reliant on data and technology, thinking it will solve the problems. And in some cases, it could do some of the work. And maybe in some cases, it could do all the work. But without the human element being involved, we lose so much. We lose experience. We lose background. We lose instinct. We lose all these things that that need to be there. And maybe most important, and this is why I love the change from STEM to STEAM, right? Science, technology, and all that. But then they're adding in arts because the human element brings so much creativity and power to information. It brings data storytelling, right? Because no one wants to just sit there and look at a massive table and say, tell me what this shows me. That, that would be horrendous. But when you bring in the human element and they can build a beautiful data visualization that tells the story that can be tied back to the business, that can provide insights, then you could communicate it. You bring the creativity, the human element, the power that our brain, our own personal technology and software can bring matters. And so when I talk data literacy, we're not looking at replacing all the technology. And in the world, we should not be looking at the technology replacing all of us. It's the combination of the human element with the data element that allows us to bring this all together. So the research by Click and Accenture shows that the world of work isn't half data literate. We've got a long way to go. Does that surprise you from your perspective at this point in time? Not necessarily a surprise. Like I spoke a little bit about this earlier. When, when you think about history, and data, computers, statistics, those fields that you would normally think of when it comes to the usage of data and information to make a decision. We lose sight of the fact that 20, 30 years ago, that's not what most people were going to school for. Uh, we Again, we see the rise in that, but it's it's we have to look at data from too many different areas. We have to look at it from this person's perspective, that person's perspective, all of that. When you, when you take a look at some of the numbers that we have in here, I think a lot of it is fear-based, right? Only in this study we did, only 37% of employees trust their decisions more when they're based on data. And almost half frequently defer to making decisions based on gut feel over data-driven insight. That, to me, should be reversed. It should be, we make a decision based on gut feel. Let's see what the data says. Does it back it up? Does it not back it up? Can we reverse this? Can we see what we could do differently? So it, it doesn't necessarily surprise me based on where we've been in the past. But it would surprise me if in 20 years I had that question come to me and we're still not much better. 20 years? Wait a minute. 20 years? I'm thinking two years. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, the companies that embrace it now are going to succeed. Those that don't embrace this data and digital world, they will fall behind. There's no doubt of that. Yeah, you're right. Two years, one year. And even the companies that I'm working with right now, if I, through the strategies and things that I help them build, do not see an increase in their data literacy and then see productivity change, then we've got to reevaluate that ourselves. So it's, you know, this inability 
in the past to embrace it, I think really came because of fear and intimidation versus it, which is just a true lack of understanding. And now we're seeing that reverse course in data literacy. You know, when I started this journey, yeah, almost four years ago, it was in, in June of 2016. So three and a half years ago, you know, data literacy wasn't even a blip on the map. And now it's everywhere because companies are now seeing the need for it. So what's the solution for smaller or medium-sized organizations here? I mean, should SMBs be hiring data consultants to do the heavy lifting? How does this all work strategically? Because I get, you know, if you're a large corporation, you know, yes, of course, it's it's kind of a no-brainer. But what about the small to mediums? It's, it's a very good question. You know, I think sometimes we think we could just hire an outside firm, bring them in, let them take over, and we'll be fine. But then what do you do when they leave? So for me, no matter the size of company, Company, small, medium, large, you have to make this a part of the lifeblood of that organization. In fact, I'm very fond of saying when I talk about culture and the adoption of data literacy is we're here to help weave the DNA of data throughout your organization. So you could hire an external consultancy or some sort of firm to come on site and help build your strategy, help implement it. But you have to create this as the lifeblood that you have a leader who is willing to step up and be that sort of chief data officer that is in there. You have to have leadership uh, across the organization who is saying, we need to use data here. We need to invest properly. We need to make sure that our workforce is being empowered properly. And again, that doesn't mean everyone needs to be a data scientist. It doesn't even mean that the leader who is enthusiastic about it needs to be that technical. But you have to have people, one, someone who has the technical skills to help keep that train going. You need the rest of the workforce to be data literate so that whether you do it outside or you just hire a full-time CDO or whatever it is in the site so that as the process is going, it's not left behind. That the change management and everything occurring is done properly so that it truly becomes essential and a true part of that organization. So are we not doing enough then to bring data literacy into the workforce? Where are we at with all that? Yeah, it's a good question. So conducted studies to understand this, along with this one that that was done with Accenture, the human impact of data literacy, we've conducted trying to find answers. You know, we found that, you know, going through organizations, one of our studies showed 92%, I believe it was decision makers, they were said that data literacy or these skills mattered. And then when you reviewed the flip side, how many of you are actually doing something Something significant about it. If almost 100% of you think this should happen, how many of you doing actual work, significant things to make it happen? It was 17%. That, right, it doesn't surprise me that there's a large gap. It does surprise me that it's a lot of lip service at this point. And so we don't want that to continue. But we do see some of the things that I do think are benefited is that we do find there's an increase in awareness. We do find there's more organizations reaching out for help and there are plans and things in place to make that happen. So we have to, I don't think we're doing enough yet. If you want my blunt straight up answer, no. But at least, right, at least just, you know, three and a half years ago, again, when I, I got this train rolling, data literacy was not pretty much anything. If you had asked me then that I would be on this podcast with you today, or I'd get to travel the world talking to companies big and small, I would have been like, uh, hopefully, you know, but now we see it dot everywhere. And that's the fantastic thing. It's going across industries. It's going across verticals. It's going across regions. The only region that I haven't helped work in is Antarctica so far. That's the reality is it's going across. And here's, here's a prime example of we're seeing this shift happen. One of the most unique requests I have received, it was an engineering university out of Brazil in South America. And their request to me, was, can you help us teach calculus differently? And I was like, absolutely. I love calculus. Let's do this. And what they told me was all of these engineers were teaching calculus too. They don't know what to do with it when they go into the real world. So it's not like they're excited. And I was like, yeah, you're talking about math education in general, the context applicability base. And that's a part of it. So we see it in the education and then in organizations, all shapes and sizes, they're reaching out for help. It's not enough yet. We need more and more to buy in and it will get there. We, we can't keep having this productivity crisis happen. We can't have this overwhelming feeling that we found in, in this study that we did. We have to help people do more. And educate. I think that's a huge point that you're making. I mean, what age do you think, ideally, Jordan, we should be educating kids about this? Is there a grade? I mean, tell us, tell us where this begins. 
So to me, it starts when they're they're smallest of smalls. And let me explain this. So one of my favorite authors, speakers, podcast guests I ever listened to is Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist. A lot of people know who he is. And I was listening to an episode with him and he brought up something interesting. He's like, one of the things that we do as parents, I have five children, right? They range, my youngest is almost three. And what's interesting is when your parents, and you, and this is an example that Neil deGrasse Tyson was sharing. When you see that kid walk up to a table where there's a glass of water on it, everyone will run at that child and say, stop, no, don't touch. Or there's a big muddy puddle sitting in the middle of the road. And instead of let your kid run and jump in that, every parent pulls them aside. And what he's speaking to, and I completely agree with this, and I'll I'll kind of coin this with these three C's of data literacy I talk about is we're stifling curiosity at that point. Because what those kids are doing at that young of an age is doing their own experiments. They're allowing their curiosity to be there. So for me, data literacy and where I'm going, one of the three C's of data literacy that I have coined is curiosity. We have to recreate curiosity in everyone is and that starts with kids don't stifle now of course there are situations you have to stay in. yeah no there's a danger point too but that's how we learn as humans right we we knock we we knock that glass over maybe make it plastic there's other ways to look at this but i totally hear you on that that makes so much sense let them jump in that muddy puddle sure your car might get a little dirty but that kid just learned that that was it awesome experience. It was funny. In fact, it was funny. We went to breakfast as a family and I took my my youngest out to go for a little walk when we were done eating, waiting for the check. And I saw puddles of water and I, I'm like, go jump in that. You know, I, I, like, it was so fresh on my mind. But to me, it starts that young. The, the three C's of data literacy that I've coined are, are curiosity, creativity, and critical thinking, because that starts data literacy right there. And so if you could get your kids at a young age, to do those things. I I think we're living in a famine in this world of critical thinking, right? I mean, it just doesn't exist much anymore. We need to ingrain at that young age, even before elementary, that you need to think things through, that you need to be curious and be creative, do all these things. Then when you get to school, it's very interesting. The number one questions I get from journalists are, is education broken? And I don't necessarily want to say that education is broken, but we still, here, at least here in the U.S., our education system is based on 50, 60, 70 years ago, the methodologies and things that were happening, agriculture and all that. It's shifted, and we need to shift too. There's a great book out there called uh, Out of Our Minds by Sir Ken Robinson. He's actually got some of the most popular TED Talks of all time where he talks about the shifting in education. We need to bring all that stuff back versus kind of creating this linear approach to anything. So with education, everything, it starts as young as possible, pretty much. Help them develop that. And then when you get into school, yes, teach them critical thinking skills. Teach them how to use data. Teach them how to maybe build a data visualization. Then as they get older and older, teach them how to then take that curiosity and apply it to a decision. Because then when they get to the workplace, it's ingrained in them. It's habit. It's a part of who they are on being able to make a smart decision with data. And that's the same thing that we talked about earlier, right? We need to make the lifeblood of the organization needs to be data literacy, data and analytics. Well, if we can make the lifeblood of every person starting from a young age, curiosity, making smarter, informed decisions, critical thinking, it starts that young. And I know that that's not a specific because there are people out there, right? They want that linear approach. Start in 10th grade with this. You, you can't do that. It's not one size fits all. It's start young. And as they get older, add to it. It's that education add the learning on top of it. It's crystal ball time. Time flies here. So tell me, Jordan, what are your predictions for the future of work, having just said all that? Data and analytics is not going to slow down. So the companies that want to succeed into the future have to embrace data literacy. They have to. Uh, so you have to have those skills. I do think we are gonna, we're going to see this resurgence of the arts come back. But what I mean by the arts coming back is, I don't know if we can deny that the shifting economy, the digital world is is changing jobs. We're not necessarily going to see robots take over everybody, jobs and things like that. No, I don't believe that. What I think we have to do is embrace that things are changing, change education so that the arts are a part of it again, combined with technology, which is different. I think historically they've been kind of separate. And now I think they're going to come back together. So that would be crystal ball number two. And then number three is I do think technology is going to become an amazing augmenting thing in our careers. Not something that we need to fear. And we're already seeing it to a degree, but not something we need to fear, something we need to embrace. We don't want to be Luddites, right? Back years ago, we we need to embrace what's happening. We need to embrace this technology, allow it to be an augmented piece that is with us. Because who doesn't want to be able to do their job more effectively? Who doesn't want to eliminate maybe those 
tedious processes that have occurred in your roles. We need to embrace technology that augmented intelligence. That's something we call it at Click. It's AI, but it's augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. And so when you bring all that together, I think you have trends crystal ball things in the future that if everybody embraces it, if everybody educates themselves more and embraces the learning that needs to take place, man, the the future to me, data is exciting when used properly. And so we have great, great opportunity to embrace that and see that it happens. Well, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Keep the conversation a moving. Join us for our Work Trends Twitter chat. We are going to be on the Twitters with Jordan Morrow on Wednesday, January 29th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, 10.30 a.m. Pacific, or wherever you're hanging out around the globe. Join us to talk about how to improve our data literacy and weave data into the DNA of the new workforce. And if you'd like to get our Twitter chat questions in advance, sign up for our newsletter at talentculture.com. Thanks for listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. Join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter chat with our podcast guest. To learn more about guests featured on today's show, visit the show notes for this episode at talentculture.com and help us spread the word. Subscribe to Work Trends wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating, review, and iTunes. Share Work Trends with your coworkers, your friends. Look forward to it. See you next time.